Mass Effect is a fiction, but that doesn't make its effect on mass culture any less important. So in uh, the spirit of very important and influential and um, meaningful fictions, this is the book, this is the encyclopedia, the lore, the origins, the background, the behind the scenes, and the uh, Bible, sacred text of, of Mass Effect, the original trilogy largely revolves around So the original trilogy largely revolves around a soldier named Commander Shepard, whose mission, mission it is to save the galaxy from a race of powerful beings, mechanical beings, known as the Reapers. And of course their agents, including the first game's antagonist, Saren Arterius. First game released in 2007 sees Shepard investigating Saren, whom Shepard slowly comes to understand is operating under the guidance of Sovereign, a Reaper left behind in the Milky Way tens of thousands of years before when the Reapers exterminated virtually all sentient organic life. As part of a recurrent cycle of genocide, for a uh, genocide with a yet unknown purpose, Sovereign's purpose is to trigger
takes place in the Andromeda Galaxy and features a new cast of characters. So this series is highly regarded for its narrative, character development, voice acting, universe, and emphasis on the uh, player choice affecting the experience. Um, I'm seriously contemplating like buying an old PS3 just so I can play it. So the, the setting is that the Mass Effect original trilogy takes place in a fictional version of the Milky Way, of course, towards the end of the 22nd century. The Milky Way is inhabited by a variety of unique characters from many different sapient species. Most of whom based their technological achievements on that of an ancient civilization called the Protheans. The advanced technology left by the Protheans includes quantities of a substance called element zero. Element zero which, of course, can be used to alter the mass of anything near it. Whew. Weird. Um, I think I just saw a big bird. Right, right when I said that. Just, I don't know. Weird. The, uh, so by utilizing this mass effect, Galaxy's many races are able to develop technologies such as faster than light travel, force fields, and artificial gravity. Roughly 3,000 years before the start of the series, a galactic community was formed from the remnants of the Prothean civilization. This community is headed by the Citadel Council bureaucratic association led by unique, three unique species. The first is the Theosari, a race of monogendered beings closely resembling blue-skinned human women. Next is the Solarian, species with considerable technological powers. Um, and the uh, Turians is the final. A heavily belligerent and militaristic race of bird-like humanoids. Sounds a lot like a derivative of the Klingons, perhaps. So, over these centuries, the Council has encountered many other species that have become close political associates, while others remain independent. In 2148, the 22nd century, explorers on Mars discovered that discover ruins of a Prothean outpost. Additionally, Charon, or Charon, is discovered to be a Prothean artifact called a mass relay, which enables near instantaneous travel to Arcturus. It is one of many mass relays littered about the galaxy. use allows humanity to come in contact with the Citadel Council and its associate species. As the year, as of the year 2183, the time in which the first game is set, mankind is the newest species to join the galactic community and of course still working to make a name for itself. The Citadel Council 
positioned the Milky Way into five different sectors known as the Terminus Systems, the Attican Traverse, Inner and Outer Council Space, and Alliance Space. So Earth is a significant setting, particularly in the third installment. A space station known as the Citadel, left behind by the Protheans, serves as the capital of the galaxy. Most species have an embassy there, and the Council meets there to uh, deliberate on matters of galactic import. in the Helios cluster of the Andromeda galaxy, 634 years after the events of its predecessor. When the Milky Way races arrive there, Helios is embroiled in a brutal conflict between the two native races. The Ket, a barbaric race obsessed with assimilating the traits of the other sentient species through a process known as exaltation. And the Ingara, a humanoid species whose civilization has recently been targeted and nearly decimated by the Ket. change the way people thought 
Mass Effect introduced gamers to a player character that was completely customizable to the player and even had their own voice. You could make different decisions throughout the game to impact the story and develop relationships with non-player characters that could range from friendship to romance. Friendship. Aspects of this universe would change as future games were released. The possibilities of this new world became clear in the original installment and sparked a passionate fan base that felt so invested that they would voice their praise and criticism in equal measure. So, it's been about 11 years since that release, almost. Uh, I want to show you guys the beginning in 2003. Let's go all the way back to 2003. What's that? 15 years ago right now. Bioware released the Star Wars role-playing game Knights of the Old Republic. Greg Zeshuk, Bioware co-founder, says, After we finished Knights of the Old Republic, we weren't doing the sequel, so Casey Hudson, Mass Effect's director, and Ray um, Mus Musica, Bioware co-founder, and I. So Casey and I sat down. Casey, Ray, and I, Greg, sat down and we talked about, well, what's next? It was a very high level at that point. And, um, I was like, well, let's do our own space opera. I think that's what the team, that the team was very passionate about doing. Some kind of sci-fi character-driven game. We just started out very vaguely that we were going to do something in that vein. It was quite definitive, and we knew we could pursue it based on how the industry, industry was at that time and in terms of our stature and ability. We started pursuing it. It took a while for what would become Mass Effect to take shape. It was probably eight months pre-production um, where we kind of narrowed it and uh, to define what we're actually going to make. A lot of meetings and a lot of conversations took place. It was initially pitched as a trilogy. I think Casey and I went to X05 in Amsterdam and we pitched it right then and there as a trilogy. And everyone said, oh, that's quite daring. And I think our, our vision was to try to get the entire trilogy onto a single platform, like a single iteration of the Xbox. We made our we made that our goal right from the outset, so that kind of helped the uh, development in a lot of ways because you knew what you were going to be continuing on. And again, Bioware, Bioware had a lot of experience in sort of maintaining games, saving stats, and a lot of unique complexities in what we do in terms of vision trees and that sort of thing. So, a team, naturally, was assembled to tackle this new space opera. You had Ginny McSwain. Ginny McSwain was the voice director. She says, I had done a couple smaller jobs with Bioware, and uh, I want to give a big shout out to Chris Borders, who was casting director. Um, there was a time he was throwing me a lot of work because he was in Orange County and he wanted LA voice directors. Uh, Jack Wall, the composer, he did. Uh, he had a relationship with Bioware already. We worked on a game called Jade Empire. Before that, and I think it, uh, they called it SFX. It was the code name for the game at the time because they were being secretive about it. But they asked me to audition.
session for their next game that was uh, going to be Mass Effect eventually and they were kind of trying to put out a call and then were trying to find the right composer um, so he won the edition so now I haven't heard the uh, soundtrack but I heard the track but I heard that it's really good so why I wanted to include this part. So I met Jack Wall, um, one of the composers, Sam, says, I met Jack Wall at the Game Developers Conference. I think it was 2005, and I particularly, um, no, I participated in the demo derby. Um, where basically composers can bring a demo CD and you go to a room and, you know, listen to people's CDs, and uh, the guy liked it, and later on we just kind of chit-chatted a bit, and um, that's how I formed my, my relationship with him, and of course then he recruited in the summer of 05 me into uh, Sam Ulick, this guy recruited Sam to uh, part of the composition, the musical score team on this top secret project, and uh, the guy didn't have a lot of experience at the time, so of course he was really pumped about it. He was floored, as he says. I gave him my all, and at some point during the process, it says, uh, Jack says, my schedule. So it looks like Sam's, Sam Ulick's uh, rival Jack Wall that he uh, participated in the demo with was actually chosen, was actually uh, the, the first choice for, uh, for being the composer, but then later on, as Sam was uh, kicked off, you know, Wall, Jack Wall, we'll call him Wall, um, kind of started vying for uh, buying for Sam Hulick, so we'll call him Hulick. So Wall actually realized the um, skill and talent of Hulick and eventually got him on the team to go compose the Mass Effect sequel, or uh, soundtrack, sorry. Wall says they sent me artwork and a brief about the game and what it was going to be about. And, uh, um, also, the type of music that Casey Hudson, the director, was looking for. The reference material was Tangerine Dream, Vangelis, and Blade Runner. You know, that kind of stuff, 80s synth music. Uh, sort of used as an orchestra, which was kind of a big musical direction. Um, for certain sci-fi back in the 80s. So they wanted to return to that idea. And uh, in some way, and what they kept saying was, imagine you're an orchestra and somebody's playing a synthesizer on stage with an orchestra. So Hulick, the, um, says the process was pretty much a, like a kind of divide and conquer. I think my first task was to actually work on the main theme and that was a lot of work. It took several revisions to get what we wanted because Casey Hudson knew exactly what he wanted. And, um, which is good. You want that in a director. Um, and he kept guiding us to the right direction for the main theme. Well, that was my first task when I got on board and Jack helped mix and finish that. And, uh, and this is actually a pretty interesting bit about the creative process itself between a talented group of artists. Zeshuk, Zeshuk says I had more of an editorial role and um, then Casey and the team would go off and come back and pitch ideas and we'd bounce ideas back and forth. So I'd say for actual act of designing the world, my role was limited, but it was more like being a sounding board for the folks that were working on it and represent the consumer. And, uh, that perspective for the most part, because we were mounting multiple projects 
Alex's check wall says I wasn't known as a synthesizer guy. I was more of an orchestral composer and a guy who looks for sounds that are interesting to put into the games I was working on. When it came to Mass Effect, I sort of had to learn how to use synthesizers in the way they weren't, in the way they were used back in the day. I sort of brought my own aesthetic to synth music and really spent time trying to create a vibe rather than scoring a picture. Um, the Helix says in a way the whole thing was challenging because it was my first really massive project and I was uh, glad to have Jack there with me. Um, so they went to E3 around 2006 and uh, they wanted a little score for a trailer and it turns out that it totally bombed. Uh, this misses the mark and we have a two day deadline to wrap the thing up and get it right. I was nervous, I didn't sleep at all, I just worked around the clock for two days after that and eventually pulled through and did the trailer for them. That's probably one of the most challenging parts because I was on a tight deadline. So they were uh, Jack Wall and Sam Hewlett were the original composers. Now for the voices and for any of you who've played Mass Effect, um, Everything I've read is that these voice these voiceovers were phenomenal. Um, they were just brilliant. So uh, this will be interesting. Bringing the bringing the characters to life for this new universe would uh, would be a group of voice actors from a range of backgrounds and locations. The process would have them spending hours recording for the game. Um, they come down from Edmonton and uh, monitor and uh, so McSwain McSwain says they uh, come down from Edmonton and um, they'd, uh, they'd back and forth and then they'd come back go back to Canada and would listen in sometimes and um, let's see let's make this interesting there's a lot of fluff in here. Many of them had multiple sessions where they would come back, but working with these brilliant actors, many of which I knew, several I didn't, was, uh, and watching them for these two rounds, I really got into it. I think Mass Effect would be one of the highlights of my career, she says. So Mark Mir, the voice of Commander Shepard, said I had already been working in Bioware in a number of capacities since the late 90s. When Mass Effect first came along, I was actually working on a game, um, on the game before I was cast as Commander Shepard, since, since I had mostly been playing monsters and creatures and uh, villains in previous releases. They, uh, brought me in at the concept art stage to sort of do a presentation on what I thought the various alien races might sound like. I got to uh, look at the concept art, and the game itself had not even been written, but I looked at all this art and background and, uh, on alien cultures and their biology, and during this process I was coming in and doing demos for aliens and uh, whatnot, and I asked if uh, I was asked if I would mind auditioning for Shepard because I did some scratch dialogue. I didn't think it would I would get uh, get it in a million years, but then I was uh, given a call back, and it was kind of a normal uh, interview process, and it was back and forth, and he didn't think he'd get it at any point. So it's interesting little underdog story there for the voice of Commander Shepard. And, uh... Yeah, so apparently he was the lead 
and he got to play the voice of a bunch of aliens, so they were using him to his full potential. And then, uh, so you have uh, the voice of Caden Alenko, or is his, uh, whose name is Raphael Sabar, Sabarch. Um, he'd done Star Wars games and uh, something called Grim Fandango. I don't know what that is, but. It was, uh, yeah, he liked it. Not much to say there. Um, and then the voice of Lyra Sony said, I got my audition through an agent, and uh, she was given a few different characters to read. And uh, I guess apparently got the part after only doing about four lines of dialogue for Lyra. Lyra. The writing of Bio at BioWare was so incredible that it was very easy for me to um, so Mass Effect. Um, I guess one of the most intriguing parts about this game was that it offered players the chance to not only make multiple decisions in the game, but to choose different dialogues uh, that could be impacted by choosing a moral path of Paragon or Renegade. This meant that there were a number of variations in the dialogue that had to be recorded as well. So Mir was saying that um, it was something of a challenge because they relied heavily on their directors. They were the ones that gave us the context to know which path they were currently following tend to, uh, in a given scene, cover the renegade path or paragon separately, so at least you had to run through the scene and, um, you know, but of course there were, you would understand the emotions that you would have to portray, but there was some overlap and you couldn't take any emotion too far in any direction because some people might play pure renegade or pure paragon all the way. And uh, some would bounce back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and so, you, uh, if, uh, if you had too much emotive uh, force in one direction or another, good or bad or anxious or worried or uh, uh, calm and relaxed or happy, um, you had to temper your emotional responses, or else it sounds like the characters are having these extreme mood swings, bouncing back and forth between the uh, the lines of dialogue. So uh, that was interesting. And uh, Mc McSwain says, uh, "Yeah, there is definitely highly technical. You have to have a good ear for." different people and characters in different scenes. Um, when you look at what they were asked to do in a four-hour or two-hour session, it's not like we can sit there and discuss options. They have to immediately go into these different sequences, and uh, you can only do it in maybe two or three takes and have 250 lines, say, with Jennifer Hale. I know I've got to get these done in four hours. She's the best, and she's the queen of this technical process. Um, and Sparge says, or maybe Sabar, hey, I don't know, says, uh, what I obviously did was not nearly as intense as uh, Shepard's and what he had to do, but you had this enormous stack of pages and be there in front of the microphone with just the engineer and a director behind a double-bladed glass. Uh, for four hours, but by the end he was exhausted. It was such concentrated work. You kind of work through the stack, and sometimes in the beginning for a while they would stop and try to explain every eventuality. And eventually, even if we hadn't played that section or didn't know the storyline, um, all 
the explaining seemed to become less necessary and uh, they had a shorthand that they kind of used. So, um, stories, characters, and relationships, the decisions that, uh, that stood out because they were part of a compelling story with characters that fans would grow to care about. Those characters would develop relationships with each other and with the player character on a deep, deep level. So, after Mass Effect, um, to move on to their actual uh, announcement, their uh, procurement, their uh, unveilment, their rollout, I uh, guess their, uh, their first week after its launch, sold uh, one million copies of the game. That's that's insane. That's a huge cop. That's so. Um, one of the actors said it hit like an explosion. And two, and then three, and it just grew with incarnation. With each incarnation, and the worldwide audience just grew. Um, I've been on long panels and. I haven't said this, but there's been people who know a lot more about gaming than I do, and that have said this game is Mass Effect, the series, essentially what Star Wars was to movies. It was that big. So, um, it was that much of a game changer. It had that much of an impact in terms of really shifting the space and changing everyone's imagination and uh, of what's possible creating this enormous worldwide audience. So, uh, I think that was a, a good way to wrap it up. And I'm going to wrap up this episode uh, by saying another big thank you once again to all my patrons and um, to, um, to uh, all my other supporters through all the different avenues, whether it's uh, PayPal or Venmo or um, just uh, through the live chats through YouTube. I just want to, um, I just want to drive the point home on how much it means to me that you guys are interested in what I'm doing here. So if you enjoy the episode, please um, don't forget to uh, like, uh, if you like it, um, Let's me know that what I'm doing is uh, is, is good and I'm, I'm heading in the general right direction. And of course, give me your feedback in the comment section if you liked this topic. Um, so, I just want to say thanks to Ella, Gregory, Simon Smith, Katie McHale, uh, Cameron, Hardyak, Potato Launch, Alexandra Ruyo. Arujo, Dylan, Dale Chester, Andy, Josh Melters, um, Matthias Fiber, Marco, Debbie Cottrell, and um, Kieran Cox, Sean, Antoine Isa, uh, Eric Castro, Sander, uh, Richard, um, yeah, thank you guys. A million, a million thank yous. You guys keep me going. You guys keep me wanting to do this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not always easy to slide it in with, uh, trying to be productive. Uh, yeah, I just want to say how much it means that you guys do support the channel and that you guys, uh, are increasingly enjoying it. And, you know, I love doing astronomy and, uh, speculative space futurism and... Um, I don't know, I, I enjoy science, philosophy, obviously psychology, everybody knows that, um, and I love exploring new topics, such as uh, art, and, you know, what falls in that category is this very episode, so, um, yeah, I have quite a few topics in queue to do, uh, but if you guys have any really, um, any, any meaningful suggestions, of course, please put them in the comments below and interact and, um, yeah, give me feedback and, you know, 
uh, discuss what you guys like about the channel, obviously, below. So, yeah, thank you all for your subs and your comments and your activity and your general support. It makes the channel more than what I could singly alone bring to it. Um, it makes the channel a real channel. It brings it together and uh, makes it much more than just me. It's uh, great to relate and get to know all of you. So, um, 